Uh, I'm very proud to introduce our next speaker. She's a total motherfucking badass. Amanda Mercat. <laughs> To be fair, I asked her to say that. <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, so my name is uh, Amanda Marcotte. I'm here, I, I realize in the schedule, it says feminism by the numbers, but then I was like, oh, I'm bored by that. I'm bored by that. And I was also going through the Values Voters um, web like video stream, and I realized this crap is way more entertaining for you guys. So I'm going to do how the religious right is cranking up the war on women. Before I start this, I wanted to storyify this and put it in a, um, a like a a panel for you guys. And unfortunately, um, I forgot. So I'll just reca recap like my a hilarious interaction with a Christian on Twitter the other day. Um, I have I write frequently for Salon and Alternet. They usually share their content pieces, kind of listicles about the Christian right and all these sorts of things. And they kind of asked me to do one on how are Christians trying to appeal the, to the young. So I did like five Christians who were trying to be hipsters. Like I was making fun of them and they got really hurt. <laughs> they were just like, you didn't, you said it wasn't cool. <laughs> and um, they were attacking me on Twitter and one guy was like, all your articles on alternate are about Christianity. You must just be obsessed with Christianity. I was like, or paid? Anyway, I was like, I tell you what, dude, I'll stop being obsessed with Christianity when you stop being obsessed with women's bodies. I was like, I'll make you a deal. I knew that wasn't a deal he was willing to make. Like, even if he just made that deal, I would have been up for it, I think, but I knew he wasn't going to. So how the religious right is cranking up the war on women and why you should worry, but also be optimistic. So you're not imagining it. There is an uptick in attacks on women's rights in recent years, like a massive uptick in the, at least in the US, but also around the world, which we'll talk about a little, just a little though, um, because I don't want to be too multicultural. <laughs> um, the scope of attacks is broadening, um, and it's, it used to be very just much about abortion, um, just really focused on women's right to terminate a pregnancy, but now it's really kind of getting bigger than that, which is most of what this talk is gonna be about. And while there are some secular figures involved, I want to emphasize very, very much, I cannot emphasize this enough, when we're talking about the war on women, which is called often like things like the Republican war on women or the conservative war on women, what it really is, at the end of the day, is the religious rights war on women. And really, it's, it's not just about gender and it's not just about sexuality, so that's like anxieties about those things, feel it. It's also about the religious right trying to assert its cultural dominance in America against creeping secularism, using women's bodies as the sort of locus of control. Like, if we control women's bodies, we can control America. We control where life comes from and who, and who gives it and who doesn't give it and whether they have a choice in that matter. We control... America, we control the culture. That's kind of, I don't think a lot of them think of it consciously this way, but that is very much underneath what's lying the emotional motivation behind the war on women. Um, so, I'm going to talk very briefly about abortion, but this is gonna be very brief because I want to emphasize and I want your takeaway from this talk to be that the religious rights war on women is about so much more than abortion. It was never just about abortion. The reason that they focused on abortion for decades was that it was a, an easy argument to make their sides seem a little bit more righteous on, like right to life. They could make those arguments. It, it was never really about right to life, uh, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, but the reason that abortion was such an attractive thing for them to attack was that it to people who didn't really understand the issue in depth, it, very, it seemed to make a lot of sense to be like, well, that's a baby and we care about it, et cetera. So needless to say, with the war on women rising, um, attacks on abortion rights are a huge part of it. And this is a graph from the Guttmacher Institute just to show you how many new laws are being passed statewide. And, and a lot of this was a reaction to the election of Barack Obama and it's been seen the religious right really sees the election of Barack Obama as an attack on their cultural dominance because not only is he black and a Democrat and liberal and pro-choice, 
but his name and the fact that he's got this multicultural background basically suggests that their ability to sort of set the cultural tone, their ability to say we are mainstream America is really disappearing. And when that is happening to them, they react this way. They attack women's bodies. They try to assert control by attacking women's bodies. So um, most of these regulations um, are under the guise of trying to improve the health and safety standards of abortion clinics. <laughs> but they're really not about that. Um, they are about shutting down the abortion clinics. So the law that passed in Texas um, is expected eventually to shut down 37 of the 42 abortion providers in the state. So that's the abortion part. Now what I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about is it's not about just abortion anymore. It's about everything. And I'm going to prove this to you tonight. It's about contraception access. It's about education and job opportunities for women. And it's even, and I know this is shocking because you would think this wouldn't be controversial, but it's even attacks on protections against rape and domestic violence, which used to be completely nonpartisan issue, at least in theory. Um, and it's attacks on Tippi Hedren. <laughs> I'm kidding, nobody's attacking Tippi Hedren anymore. <laughs> um, so basically, like, I, it's very important to understand that Christian conservatives are very culturally insecure. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. They believe that they have the right to run the country, but they also, and I think that they're right to know this, realize that they don't, and that in a lot of ways they're deeply unpopular. <laughs> um, they end up therefore kind of internalizing this notion in the worst and most toxic ways. They think that they're being warred on as if, and if you believe that your right to be culturally dominant is a right, when people deny you the ability to be culturally dominant, <laughs> you feel like your rights are being taken away. So, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of an interesting thing. So, one of the things that has been happening in the, the US and around the world is as secularism is growing, multiculturalism is growing, various kind of notions of like liberal progressive secularism are growing, Christians are actually becoming more obsessed with their sort of image as Christians and they're becoming more competitive about, I'm a Christian, I have to prove myself, I have to prove how Christian I am, how tough I am, how pure really I am. And, and you see the word purity come up a lot. And being willing to show how tough you are by being tough on women is kind of a way that Christians sort of assert themselves. Um, in the U.S., I would say that the, the sort of struggle is over this, what they consider secular humanist culture versus Christian uh, conservatism. And definitely liberal Christians fall under the secular humanist umbrella in this way. Um, so they kind of try to prove how tough they are and how willing they are to restrict women's rights and, and how patriarchal really they are um, in, in tension with secular humanism, which they see as sexually liberated, um, feminist, all these other things I think are great. Um, in other countries, I would actually say the struggle is often more between the Catholics and the Protestants, like in Latin American countries for cultural dominance. and. But it doesn't matter, like even with the struggle between the Protestants and the Catholics for cultural dominance in Latin American countries, the way they demonstrate who's the, the most Christian, the biggest lovers of Jesus, the most culturally dominant, is to attack women's rights. Um, so what we're beginning to see is that the Christian right is becoming increasingly overtly misogynist. Now they've always been like misogynist, <laughs> like don't get me wrong. They've always had this kind of, I mean, the notion that women's role in the world is to be men's help meet and to be breeders and to not do anything else has always been a part of the kind of Christian right philosophy. But you're starting to see more misogynist ideas that hadn't necessarily been, they hadn't been overt about coming out. And I think that the Todd Aiken situation, which I'm sure like all of you <laughs> remember, where he said that women who suffered legitimate rape, legitimate rape can't be, get pregnant, was a really good example of this. It wasn't just that he was doing the Christian right thing of just making up what science that you feel is most 
convenient, like just making up some bullshit <laughs> about how um, we don't need an exception for oh, an abortion laws for rape because women can't get pregnant that way. Like that, that was part of it. But the other part of it, and I think the part that was more interesting and offensive in a lot of ways was that he was forwarding what I had, I previously considered a, a non-religious, particularly misogynist idea that women make up rape to cover how ashamed they are that they consented to sex. So it, it was an interesting cultural moment because you're beginning to see the Christian right merge with kind of more the Maxim Magazine kind of misogyny. Um, the Dugar family is a really interesting example of how the Christian right in America is becoming an extremist. And the reason I say this is that by any measure, the Dugar family are, are, should be treated like cult members. Like they're a part of a very, they won't say it out loud, but they're part of a very obscure cult of Christianity called Quiverful that believes that not only that abortion and contraception are sinful, but that women literally should try to give birth to as many children as they possibly can. And that the reason is that they're trying to create, and the reason they call themselves Quiverful is a Bible verse saying that your children are quivers in the arrow for God. And so they're literally, and I'm not kidding, their philosophy is we're going to create, we're going to basically beat back secularism by outbreeding them. That's their theory. And the Dugar family belong, and it, they are, to be fair, like the Christian right does, and mass doesn't believe in this idea at all. If you look at your average Christian right family, they might have four or five kids, but they don't have, how many do the Dugars have, 19? Yeah, like... She's willing to give birth no matter what. And um, so what's interesting to me is like, they're the kind of people that in the 70s and 80s, the Christian right would have shunned. They would have said, you guys make us look crazy. <laughs> and they do. Um, you make us look um, extremist. And, and they would just say, you're, you're misinterpreting the Bible and other things like that. Now they put them on television. <laughs> And they give them speaking to events and campaign events, like Rick Santorum was doing a lot of campaign stops with the Dugars, and holding them up as really what the, the American ideal of a family should be, basically a, a cult. And Jim Dugar spoke at the, um, this is a video uh, that Right Wing Watch put up, and this was from the Value Voters Summit, which is kind of the annual, like one of the biggest kind of Christian right events of the year, and this was the speech he gave there. It should play. play. Um, back a few years ago, I heard Governor Huckabee speak, and he, uh, he was sharing about how he had taken his daughter, Sarah, to, over to uh, one of the concentration camps uh, where a lot of Jewish people were killed. And he said as they were walking out of that concentration camp, he said little Sarah at the time, uh, she, was, she was like maybe, I don't know, seven years old or so, she looked up at him and she said, Daddy, why didn't somebody do something? And you know what? That's where we are at in our nation. You know, we want our children, when they, we're going to tell them about how great America was, they're going to look at you and say, why didn't somebody do something? You know what? We have an opportunity to get involved and to make a difference. And you guys are the army that can go out and impact America. If everybody here would, would instead of sitting on those sidelines and wa watching for the bleachers, would get active, we could start a revival that would sweep the land. God bless you. All right, let me translate that speech from Christian Ray Ease to you guys. Uh, it's up on the screen, but basic for those who, who have hearing impairment, I, I'm sorry about the like kind of weirdness, but um, I was trying to take it off the YouTube video and kind of fix it up a little. Um, basically, the army thing, he's basically saying you need to breed more. That's what he means. When he talks about the Holocaust, he's talking about not just abortion, but contraception. This is coming up more and more on the Christian right, that they are comparing women who get abortions to Nazis murdering Jews in concentration camps. This used to be very fringe language, and it's becoming very mainstream language. Now, I cannot emphasize enough how offensive this is. Um, one in three American women will get an abortion in her lifetime, and they are treating them like genocidal maniac Nazis. And uh, let's just say, like, how offensive is that to the Jewish people who lost family members in the Holocaust? I mean, <laughs> those were real people that, 
had um, lives, families, memories, feelings, um, and they're dead. So this is another example of the extremist rhetoric you're starting to see on the religious right. Um, the Girl Scouts have become a major target on the religious right. I know, isn't that weird? Um, <laughs> Let me just play this clip. It, it's an audio clip from a, a, a generation, a radio, Generations Radio, a right-wing radio station, um, or radio show. And they were talking about how... The, the way I will transition my daughter into adulthood really, really, really matters. And you can ruin your kids and your grandkids. You can, you can utterly ruin them by giving them the wrong worldview and the wrong social view, and a lot of times that happens through the college experience. I'm not saying that college is wrong. I'm not saying it's malum and say. But I am saying choose wisely. Don't be an idiot. Be discerning. Understand what a biblical approach to raising sons and raising daughters is all about, and be very, very careful how you do it. In other words, keep the end goal in mind. Sure. Are you trying to create a woman who's going to compete with men in the marketplace? Are you trying to create a woman who will be a helpmeet to a man so that he can compete in the marketplace? Those are vastly different goals. And which goal you choose will in large part determine how it is you raise your child, even when she's 18 years old and finished high school. At the very least, friends, use the biblical vision. Okay, God knows what he's talking about. I know that the world tells you it's all about the 53% having kids out of wedlock. I, I know that's the goal. Yeah, so this is how like a lot of people on the Christian right talk. They just use a lot of phrases that are loaded with meaning just sort of randomly and, and unless you understand what they're talking about. It's a little hard to understand. So um, I have some of the quotes um, from the description up here for the hearing impaired. But basically... What the program was about was why you shouldn't buy Girl Scout cookies. And the reason, they initially said that the reason was that they believe the Girl Scouts are promoting lesbianism and abortion. I mean, if they were, that'd be great, but they're not. <laughs> um, the Girl Scouts are, are basically don't weigh, you know, I mean, I guess the Girl Scouts are officially, like, pro-gay. Like, they definitely are that, but they weigh not at all in on the abortion issue. So, but when you listen to that clip, you realize what they really don't like about the Girl Scouts is that the Girl Scouts, like College Education for Women, which they were also denouncing, teach girls that they are valuable as people outside of what they can do for men. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is something that comes up a lot. So you'll often find right-wing blog posts, radio shows, other programs just railing against the Girl Scouts. It's really become a thing. And they always start with the abortion and lesbianism accusation, but then it often devolves into what you heard there. Um, I also found this Christian blogger, Kathy Schiffer on Pathios, basically saying that she took her girl out of Girl Scouts because she was so offended that they had a self-esteem merit badge like that you could do like a program in self-esteem and, and good body issues like the notion of a, a girl having self-esteem has become offensive to the Christian right and that cartoon I showed was like on one of their websites um, you're seeing the Christian right attacking equal education you heard it there like college is not for girls the Dugar family for instance is not going to send any of their girls to college um, you often see that idea in Quiverful, which is beginning to infect the sort of mainstream religious right, this notion that college is wasted on girls, that it teaches them ways of being that it wouldn't make them good wives. And what you're also seeing is this kind of attitude trickle down into the elementary level, the high school level education. So in the, the South, like a lot of Christian right activists are pushing really hard for separating, segregating children based on sex and education. And they have all these arguments about it, about how kids learn better and stuff, but then when you actually start to dig, you realize that what they want is the girls to be taken aside and taught to be happy little homemakers, and the boys to be taught like the traditional curriculum, you know, and that's what they're, they're pushing for. Um, so we're seeing a war not just on pregnant women insofar as the like war on your right to abortion, 
But one of the scarier trends that's been growing in the past couple decades is a attempt to use pregnancy to control women just generally. And one of the ways they do this is they use fear-mongering about drug use as a, an excuse to basically take away pregnant women's civil rights. And so a lot of states under pressure from anti-choice groups, anti-abortion groups, have passed laws that make it legal for the state to basically take custody of your fetus. I'm serious. And if you are assumed to be using drugs or alcohol during your pregnancy, they use that as a pretext to arrest you, throw you in jail. Um, in other cases, they've tried to force women to get C-sections. Um, claiming that her, if she wasn't, she's was basically a child abuser and they would charge her with that. Other situations like that. And this was a New York Times article about how out of control these laws are getting. This woman, Alicia Beltran, um, was not actually addicted <laughs> to drugs at the time that she was pregnant. She had suffered a painkiller addiction before. Um, she kicked it. Um, she wasn't using when she got pregnant. Um, the first few weeks of her pregnancy, she was using a drug that prevents pill addiction. There's a drug you can take that keeps you from taking painkillers. It's a prescribed drug. She goes to the doctor, and when he asked her if she had an addiction history, she said, yes, but I've kicked it. She took a pee test multiple times. She never had painkillers in her system. She did have the, the drug at one point that, that, that he wanted to prescribe to her, but she didn't want to take anymore because she felt like she was over it. Um, there was, so it was, there was this battle between her and her doctor over whether or not she needed to like, get this prescription that she didn't want to take anymore because she reasonably didn't want to take anything if she could avoid it. Um, so he basically called the police on her and they showed up at her house and arrested her and told her that she could either be in jail and force-fed these anti-addiction drugs or she could go to a treatment facility, but she did not, freedom was not an option. Her fetus was given a lawyer in court, but she was not because she wasn't being charged with a crime yet. Um, and that was sort of the way around it. Um, I want to talk about El Salvador really quickly because I think this is the sort of thing we need to worry about coming to this country. As uh, abortion restrictions become increasingly strong, this is exactly the sort of end game that they're going for. Um, El Salvador basically has an absolute ban on abortion. Like in theory, you can get an abortion if your life is in danger, but that's one of those things that Inevitably, when a woman's doctor says, yeah, she's going to die if she doesn't have an abortion, um, they will say, are you sure? Are you like 100% sure? <laughs> and no doctor is ever going to say, yes, I'm 100% sure. <laughs> so they're like, okay, well, that 5%, you know, she can't have an abortion. So there was a woman, she um, had kidney failure and all these other diseases, like she was really sick. On top of it, the fetus was encephalitic. It basically had no brain, so there was, no, there was no possibility of her bringing a baby to life, and she was still denied the abortion over and over again. Finally, the government said, well, you can have a C-section, which is like literally the most dangerous, invasive way in a woman who's already sick body to end this pregnancy. So they delivered the baby with the C-section, and I mean, it died like immediately because there wasn't a brain there. Um, that's the kind of way that they sort of symbolically demonstrate the power of the Catholic Church in El Salvador using women's lives and bodies. Now, there was another report by the BBC that was absolutely alarming. There are women being arrested and thrown in jail for illegal abortion in El Salvador, of course, because abortion's illegal. But here's the weird thing about El Salvador. If you're rich, you can just go to a private hospital and they'll do an abortion and just chart it as something else for you. But if you're poor, like women will just basically buy black market RU486 basically and illegally perform abortions at home. So there's no way to catch anybody having illegal abortions. So what they do 
is if you show up at the hospital present, presenting a miscarriage, there's no way to tell the difference between an RU46 abortion and a mis just a natural miscarriage. They look exactly the same when you show up at the hospital if it, something's going wrong. If you show up at the hospital and you're bleeding and you're miscarrying and they just don't like the look of you, you will get arrested for illegal abortion there. They'll just decide that you were probably aborting. So poor women, single mothers, are getting arrested for miscarriage in El Salvador because it's the only way they can show that they're enforcing the abortion ban. And there have been something like 50 women convicted of abortion in the country. And the lawyer that they talked to for the BBC, he was representing 28 of them in, in court, and he said 27 were just miscarrying. Some of them were decorating nurseries. Like, some of them were buying baby clothes, and they miscarried, and they were thrown in jail and accused of murder. And, you know, I want to note, too, that the entire fight in, in Muslim cultures over women's bodies is a similar fight. In Christian cultures, it's over women's reproductive capacities. In Muslim cultures, the way to prove how hard you are and how Muslim you are often becomes about how much women are denied education or women are, are covered like in their clothing choices and things like driving in Saudi Arabia and stuff. But I think you know it's important. I think when we live in Christian dominated cultures, it's easy for us to look at cultures like Iran and Saudi Arabia and realize that what they're doing is they're using women's bodies to display their fealty to Islam, this very fundamentalist version of Islam. But I want to emphasize that that's going on here, that's going on in Catholic countries, it's going on all around the world. It's easy to use women because women are kind of already oppressed and treated as second class anyway. Oh. How did that happen? Okay. <laughs> So this is how the religious right in this country is hiding in plain sight. And I think that the, the cocaine mom laws are a really good example of how this works. They package their issues as kind of secular things. Uh, Richard, in his talk, was saying, like, you notice now that Christians will make their arguments about not no longer from authority and God, but they'll try to, like, make it sound like they have real-world consequences that they're worried about. So you know, um, they'll often say, well, you know, we're not against women, we just think that, like, sexual promiscuity is bad and, and link it to independent, women's independence. Or, you know, healthcare, babies, freedom. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk about the freedom excuse in a second. And in reality, they're just trying to exert control over women's bodies and show that they are the dominant culture in the U.S. Um, so I want to talk about how they therefore try to mainstream what I would consider a radical idea. So while abortion has always been controversial in the U.S., um, contraception hasn't been for a very long time. Um, contraception was legalized by Supreme Court decision in 1965. Um, by then, it was already legal in most states. Um, but in a few states there were still like morality laws against contraception and the Supreme Court basically found that those laws are a violation of your privacy. In, in, in the four decades since then, contraception has become incredibly popular. <laughs> I'm sure almost, pretty much almost everyone in this room has probably used it, right? <laughs> Uh, but also just in, in the country at large, uh, statistics show that 99% of sexually active women ages 15 to 44 have used contraception, over 99%. It's, it's basically universal. And despite this, the religious right has decided, as you can see, this is from the American Life League. This is an actual ad that they're running around on. That. <laughs> they're attacking contraception. Like, make no mistake, they are trying to mainstream the notion that contraception is um, bad and should be subject to more government control. So how do you start getting the idea into the public that contraception, which most of the public loves, it's more popular than puppies and rainbows, 
How do you start like chipping away and, and trying to instill the notion that contraception is controversial in a culture that it is absolutely not controversial? You start small. Um, one of the things that they seized upon when the Affordable Care Act passed was that there was a long, long, long list of preventive medications that the Affordable Air Care Act, aka Obamacare, requires insurers to cover without a copay under the they're basically considered preventive services. The reason that medical experts want preventive services to be mandatory without a copay is because when you take the copay away, people use the preventative services more, and then prices go down because the preventative services are cheaper in the long run than the things that they're trying to prevent. Contraception is understood by like the World Health Organization, the IOM, all these other organizations as one of the most clear-cut examples of a cost-saving preventive service. So, you know, it's a few hundred dollars a year um, for the pill. It's like fifteen hundred dollars for like ten years for the IUD, and that compared to it costs at least ten thousand and often up to thirty, forty, even more thousand dollars for birth and unplanned, an unwanted childbirth. So it's a clear-cut thing. Um, but as soon as the religious right realized that Obamacare was going to force contraception to be covered, they started to float this argument that it was a violation of religious freedom of your employer if you used contraception on the plan that you earned through being employed with them. <laughs> now, if you think about this argument, it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's a, the you, that that insurance plan is your insurance plan. You earned it by working. It belongs to you. Telling you how to spend it is about as offensive as telling you how to spend the paycheck because your boss wrote signed the check. I mean, that's functionally the same thing. Um, and yet, this argument is actually making its way in through courts. And while there's many reasons that they're doing this to attack the Affordable Care Act, to establish the notion that employers should have control over your private life, other things like that, one of the other things they're doing is they're trying to instill in the American public's head this notion that contraception is a controversial issue. Um, and it, it, it's interesting to me because prior to the ACA, most insurance plans did already cover contraception. It was never, it was just whether, like really the debate was over whether or not you had to pay a copay or not. <laughs> so they've, they've created this sense that insurance coverage of contraception is a controversial notion when it was, wasn't even just three or four years ago. It was just normal. Um, in fact, a lot of the employers that tried to sue the federal government so that they didn't have to pay for contraception benefits got their lawsuits thrown out because it turned out they already did. I'm serious, so including Catholic universities. So now you've started the idea, like you've planted the idea, we're just standing up for religious freedom. Now you start to escalate the tenor of the rhetoric around birth control. So we saw this with the attacks on Sandra Fluck, who basically spoke in favor of the contraception benefit in front of Congress. Or it was, well, I won't, I won't super pedantically correct myself. Um, and we saw like Rush Limbaugh and all these other like right-wing figures basically get up and make these kind of ludicrous accusations, <laughs> including repeatedly kind of suggesting that the cost of contraception is related to the amount of sex that you're having or the number of sexual partners that you have, which is scientifically, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, like, <laughs> I don't know if Rush Limbaugh knows this. I think that he does. He just doesn't care. He wants to basically say like the only, it's a way to warm people up to the notion that the only kind of people who would use or openly admit to using contraception are sexually deviant. Sandra Flux, sexually deviant. She's like, nice college girl getting married. <laughs> I mean, she might be sexually deviant, but we don't know. <laughs> I doubt it, though. <laughs> um, you know, and then now that you've floated the idea and now you're having it being debated on TV, you start to just kind of keep pushing it, escalating. So this is Rush Limbaugh escalating recently. I think, as usual, folks, Obama has things exactly backwards. 
Insurance is being stretched to cover things it should never have to cover. And it didn't have to cover until Obamacare came along and mandated these things get covered. And all it does is drive up prices like breast pumps and birth control pills and wellness plans. I mean, all of that stuff, all of this touchy-feely, liberal, do-good stuff that ought never be part of insurance. Buy your own birth control pill. Buy your own breast pump. Why? That's not a health issue. Used to be our choice to go out and buy a birth control pill or not. Used to be your choice to buy a breast pump or whatever. If you want to do that, pay for it yourself. But no, these things are now part of insurance. It's not insurance, it's welfare. But regardless, as long as these things are going to be mandated, covered, then somebody is going to have to pay for it. Whether you know it or not, you are going to pay for it. I'm sure nobody wants to listen to that going on and on. But listen to what he's saying and the idea he's trying to push forward. The notion that birth control pills are not legitimate health care, that they are just bad, or breast pumps. No, it, it, insurance did cover these things. It, it, it did. I, I know. I, I had insurance my whole adult life, and it always covered my birth control pills. It just covers more of my birth control pills now. It used to be a $50 copay. Now it's zero. Um, but basically, they're trying to stigmatize contraception with this. And you're beginning to hear people talk about contraception openly in ways that they would have been much more surreptitious about. So here's Rick Santorum um, at the Value Voter Summit. I, I love this clip so much because he, he's got such a punchable voice. The French voice. Revolution was based on <laughs> equality, liberty, and fraternity, not paternity. They were based on rights coming from the people, your brothers not from God. It was an anti-clerical, anti-God revolution. They burned churches. They killed clergy. And they established a secular government that turned into mob rule and then an emperor who conquered Europe and institutionalized the French revolutionary status secular rule in Europe. That is who they want us to be. And you see it. You see it in the things they do even now. They're subtle. They're little. They don't even hit on most people's radar screens. But look at Obamacare and the conscience mandate. And you could say, well, all they're trying to do is provide contraception and abortifacients for people who should have access to them. Oh, really? Oh, really? Is that all they're trying to do? Well, let's, let's take them at their word. That's all they're trying to do. Okay. What would be the easiest way to make sure that everybody who wants those pills can have them for free and have complete access to them? Give them away. Give them away at pharmacies. Give them away at supermarkets. Give them away in vending machines. If you want them to be ubiquitous, simply pay for them and give them away. But that's not what they did. What they did was say to each and every one of you whose conscience is violated by it, we will make you do what you tell, we tell you to do. They will force you to use your money. They don't subscribe to the concept of freedom of religion. No, the word they use more often now, and they actually do use these words, freedom of worship. Yeah, he keeps going on like this. Um... He's got an incre he's arguing with what he imagines your arguments to be. And, and to an extent, I think that it's true that our argument is that the government should come from social contract instead of what some asshole says God says. Yes, I, that is true, Rick Santorum. We do believe that. So does our Constitution. <laughs> um, but, you know, what I think is interesting is he's trying, I, I love that speech so much because it's perfect encapsulation of my thesis. <laughs> he's basically using contraception as kind of a, a swing point to talk about the larger debate over whose country is this? Is it a secular country that is welcoming to all people of all worship traditions, faiths, beliefs, creeds? and we just kind of keep that crap private, we pay our employees what they're owed, and we stay out of their business? Or is this a, a 
quote unquote Christian nation, their definition of Christian. And he says it's the latter and he's using contraception, he's using women's bodies as a way to advance that argument. So, I mean, it, it's critical. Um, this is another, I, I, I'm just so, maybe they're better speakers than I am, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Bauer is not, he, he, before I play this, I just wanna tell you, I had to retranscribe a lot of this because unlike Rick Soundhorn, the YouTube like transcription service <laughs> struggles. Like it got every word of Rick Santorum perfect. <laughs> it, it, Gary Bauer is a bit of a mumbler, so I had to retranscribe a lot of this. President of the United States last year picked up the phone after Sandra Fluke testified to call her and tell her how proud he was of her. You know, I, I still remember when presidents made personal phone calls to astronauts to tell them how proud they were of them. But of course, the space programs in the trash can thrown there by Barack Obama. I remember when presidents used to call heroic policemen or soldiers or someone that had gone to the point of laying down or trying to, to you know, put their own life on the line for somebody else. Now we live in an era where a president praises a promiscuous co-head because she thinks you ought to buy her birth control pills. That, my friends, is the definition of civilizational decline. Yeah, civilizational decline. That means the Christian right losing control of this country. That's what that means. And... You know, I, I promiscuous co-ed, like, I just want, I, like, I think there's no need to argue about, like, how appropriate it is to characterize women as bad people because they choose to have sex. That is, like, I'm not even going to argue that point. That's ridiculous. But I also want to remind everyone here that what Sandra Fluck said in her testimony was that she, ha she and her fellow students at Georgetown Law School had to pay $3,000 a year in insurance costs and insurance premiums, and all they wanted was their birth control covered. And he's saying, you have to buy her birth control. What, what is that $3,000 that came out of her pocket? Like, that's, that's what's being debated here. I mean, I'm not against government-funded, government-subsidized birth control at all. I'm just trying to, I mean, in fact, I agree with Rick Santorum. Just put it in vending machines, make it free. Uh, <laughs> But um, the argument here is over whether or not insurance should cover it. So now I want to kind of, I've got a little, I've got f 16 more minutes. And I'm going to talk to you about one of the most alarming, in my opinion, and most unpredictable in a lot of ways, um, developments that has happened in recent years. Um, this is about the Violence Against Women Act, rape and domestic violence. So. Now, it has been true that like the hardcore Christian right opposed the Violence Against Women Act when it was passed in 1994. They've always opposed it. Um, but the truth of the matter is the last time it was reauthorized by Congress, most Republicans voted with it for it as well as basically all Democrats. So it's not, it was previously a nonpartisan thing. It's an incredibly effective piece of legislation that has reduced domestic violence rates across the country, has reduced domestic murder rates of both men and women. It actually reduced domestic rates of men even more, domestic murder rates of men even more than of women as victims because women now can leave abusive husbands and are less likely to shoot them in self-defense. That's an actual fact. And I mean, but the Christian right has always been against it, and they've always been against it because of this philosophy of what the family's like. I got this off of a Christian website here. I didn't, this is not a cartoon making fun of them. This is actually what they believe is the, the sort of way that marriage is supposed to be, that men are the leaders of women, and they see the Violence Against Women Act, and you'll often see a lot of Christian right figures basically kind of argue openly that, like, while it's not good for men to hit women, <laughs> 
I'm serious. It's understandable sometimes, and certainly it's more dangerous to assert that women should be able to leave their husbands over mild <laughs> domestic violence. I, there was a Phyllis Schlafly article once where she even s characterized a man who was put in jail for putting his wife's head through a wall as an assault on men's basic rights because she characterized it as just the kind of minor spat that couples get into. Yeah. What's interesting, however, is the last time the Violence Against Women Act was up for authorization, all of a sudden it became controversial <laughs> amongst Republicans with all these Republican leaders, including um, like major leaders in Congress like deciding they're not gonna vote for it anymore. It was incredibly difficult. There were many rewrites. There were many debates over the Violence Against Women Act. And the pretext that they used was that the new version of the bill had very minor, very minor expansions of its powers. Um, basically, like, um, one of the questions that Republicans brought up as an excuse to attack the Violence Against Women Act and its reauthorization was a very minor point of jurisdiction over on Native American reservations. Like, like tribal leaders wanted to have a little bit more power in some cases of domestic violence to prosecute it using their own courts because like the state courts were not as effective because of all this stuff. It, it, it's not the sort of thing that congressmen are usually gonna hold up a big, massive omnibus bill like the Violence Against Women Act. It was so such a transparent excuse. There was also objections to including LGBT people um, under the umbrella, uh, immigrant protections. Like one of the immigrant protections that they were fighting over was um, how expansive a visa that you can get if you are uh, not an American, if you're an immigrant to this country, you're married to an American and he's beating, he or she is beating you, can you get it? There's a special visa you can get. And they wanted to make it a little easier to get that visa, so they were holding it up over that. Um, my theory, now I can't read their minds, but I, I, I follow the Christian right very closely, so this is my theory, um, is that the Republicans are just be holden to a Christian right that's getting incredibly belligerent about getting its way. And the Christian right doesn't like the Violence Against Women Act, and Republicans know that <laughs> they're basically, it used to be an easy vote to vote for, and now if you do, like the Christian right starts to threaten that they're gonna primary you with a Tea Party, quote unquote Tea Party primary opponent, and so you have all these Republicans voting against it. Eventually, the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization did pass because literally there's nothing that looks worse than people going on TV and saying, you're for wife beating. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a hard battle because they really are afraid, in a way they've never been before, of the Christian right primarying them. Um, just a really quick digression, you know the reason, one of the reasons that they're really afraid of this is, is Ted Cruz. Um, the Republican mainstream party wanted to nominate Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst of Texas, who is conservative on every issue. He's anti-abortion, he's all these things. He's, he, he would have been a fine Republican candidate, but this notion, he, he got stained with this notion that he was a moderate Republican or maybe slightly willing to compromise on these issues that are crucial to the Christian right. And so Ted Cruz, who is like, his father's like a Bible-thumping, crazy evangelical preacher, and he, kind of, and he speaks pure televangelical language. Like, that's Ted Cruz. Like, he's always got that face that looks like he's about to cry, like Oral Roberts, you know? Like, he's just from that culture. So they immediately, like, the Christian right immediately recognized him as one of their own, and they, pro they basically handed him the Republican nomination in Texas because they're the ones who always show up and vote in every primary. So they have an immense amount of power now. And now every single other Republican saw that and they're like, crap. <laughs> um, so this is all very depressing, like particularly the takeover of the Republican Party by the Christian right in a way that is more intense than it ever was before. But there is good news. Um, the reason that they're doing this is that they think that they're losing. They really do. They, 
the election of Barack Obama, like I said at the, at the top of the talk, was this like, oh my God, you guys elected a guy named Barack Obama. Like, that's like a Muslim name. Like how, it was, it was, it's a crisis moment for the Christian right, and it should be. They're, they are correct to be afraid. Um, the number of atheists are on the rise. So, this is, these are some of the statistics that they're watching very, very closely and are terrified by. One in five Americans has no religion at all in this country. 99% of sexually active straight women have used birth control. The average age of first marriage and the first birth are going up. This is a graph here. Um, it's hard to see. That's basically from the like 1970s, I think, until now. So you can see how rapidly that those ages are going up. Um, it, and, and this is actually from a Christian right publication where I got this graph. They're trying, they call it the great crossover <laughs> because they think that this is like somehow a profound thing. Um, the blue line is the average age of marriage. The red line is the average age of first birth. And now the average age of marriage is actually later in life than the average age of having your first child in this country. And they think that's like the worst thing that's ever happened. I, I don't, it, it's, it's interesting because this particular publication, it's definitely like a, a, a Christian right organization that kind of masquerades as a sociological organization. But they went and they actually interviewed people that had gotten married after they gave birth to their first child. And it, it was funny how alarmed they were and how non-alarming the people they talked to were who were basically like, well, you know, we just weren't ready to get married yet, but babies come when they come. And they eventually got married, a lot, most of them, so. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I wanna end on a high note and say it's okay to be optimistic. Like, all these things are really bad. Like, Texas is bad, like the attacks on contraception are bad, other things like that are bad. But in the long run, we are gradually winning the argument of this culture. Like, people are not going to stop being religious in mass, I don't think, in the United States ever, but they are starting to embrace the notion that maybe the religious right shouldn't be the culturally dominant force defining morality and government and other things in this country. Even, even evangelical Christians are slightly changing. Like, their, their young people are leaving them in droves. Um, like, huge percentages, yeah. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but huge, huge percentages of kids that are raised in evangelical households drop out of church like as soon as they get out of the house, like over half. They can do a lot of damage on the way out, so it'll be sad. I just, I, I, I know this is a sad talk, so I was like, kitty pictures. <laughs> um, so, you know, we do need to keep fighting. Like this kitten here. <laughs> this is, I, I want all of you to watch this kitten and just admire and take home his tenacity. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask for questions, but apparently we don't have questions, but you should still see this cute little cat picture. And if you have any questions, I'm going to be floating around, so feel free to walk up and ask me.